You know, I don't think I've ever seen three Guns N' Roses songs, classic Guns N' Roses songs, used more perfectly in a movie up until this point. Thor, Love and Thunder is the fourth Thor movie. Thor is the only hero in the MCU to get a quadrilogy so far. And after Thor's retirement is interrupted by Gore the God Butcher, a galactic killer who seeks the extinction of the gods, Thor enlists the help of King Valkyrie, Korg, and ex-girlfriend Jane Foster, who now inexplicably wields Mjolnir as the mighty Thor. Together they embark upon a harrowing cosmic adventure to uncover the mystery of the God Butcher's vengeance and to stop him before it's too late. Taika Waititi really struck gold with Thor Ragnarok. He really reinvented Thor, made Thor feel fresh, and made Thor feel more relatable. More importantly, he made Thor fun, and I can definitely tell you that this carries over into this film. While he doesn't do as good of a job here as he did in Ragnarok, he, this is definitely my second favorite Thor movie, and it might be one of my favorite movies of Phase 4 of the MCU. This thing has a blast in soundtrack. It is a killer soundtrack. The music just adds to the entertainment value for this movie. Anytime there's an action scene, I was really just waiting for everybody to fight to music. A lot of it was classic rock, like Guns N' Roses. Like, you know how... Ragnarok had the Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin. This was essentially the 80s, like Guns N' Roses stuff, and it made it that much more entertaining for me. Chris Hemsworth once again knocks it out of the park. It's great to see Natalie Portman come back as Jane Foster. I really like what they did with Jane Foster. I thought that there were a couple of holes they could have patched in for her story, certain elements that they could have touched on a little bit more, but essentially, what makes me overlook those is her chemistry with Chris Hemsworth and the story and the emotional weight that she and Thor have in this movie. It's really proof that the message that this, tr this movie is trying to make is that love conquers all and love is the most powerful thing you can have in the universe. And that is expressed significantly with these two characters and it was great to see her come back. It was great to see her finally have some purpose in these movies and it was great to see Jane Foster get some closure. I thought that she, Tessa Thompson, and Chris Hemsworth made a very formidable trio to go along with Korg, our favorite rock guy from Ragnarok, voiced once again by Taika Waititi. Korg kind of takes a back seat in this one. He's not as funny as he was in Ragnarok. He's also not as talkative, I don't think. I'm actually happy about that. I'm happy he's a little bit more restrained. Like, sure, he's the comic relief guy, and Korg is funny, and we all love Korg, but... It's kind of the Jeff Goldblum effect. There's only so much of Korg I could take, and I think Taika Waititi realized that, and he scaled back on Korg a little bit to the movie's betterment. What also made this movie so entertaining was that it was the vibe that the trailers gave off for me, that I felt like I was watching a 1980s fantasy movie, and that's essentially what this is. It really did, with the soundtrack, it felt like I was transported back to a movie theater in the 80s, and I was watching a fantasy movie, that came out in like 1983 or something. Like it had that vibe to it. It had the it had that silliness. It had that goofiness. It had that campiness. But it never went over the top with any of that. Love and Thunder was able to stay grounded even when it went into those territories. And it managed to balance a lot of emotional weights and more dramatic moments in this movie. I would say it does it more than Ragnarok does. Ragnarok was pretty much a straight up comedy. For the first half of this movie, I was laughing a lot. Second half I was laughing, but not nearly as much. The second half had a lot more drama to it, and I think that that added a lot more tension and a lot more weight to our characters and their journey to try and defeat Gore the God Butcher, which let's talk about Christian Bale as Gore the God Butcher, because I guarantee you when Christian Bale was handed this script, he probably read it and said, hmm, you know, you either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. And that's exactly what he did. Have we ever seen Christian Bale as a villain? Dude, Christian Bale just knocked it out of the park as Gore the God Butcher. I would not have cared as much, I don't think, about Gore the God Butcher if it wasn't Christian Bale. But, luckily, Gore the God Butcher is a fleshed out character. It's just Christian Bale's performance just elevates that character. Like, I, the best MCU villains for me, and the best villains in movies in general, are the ones you can relate to, the ones you understand where they're coming from, the ones you can somewhat agree with, even if their plan is twisted and dark like 
Seriously, I get where Thanos is coming from. He's not wrong. Yeah, that's twisted to say, but he, he's not wrong. That, for me, makes a great movie villain, and that's when the MCU villains are at their best, when they have something personal that has affected them or something personal has happened to them, and they have these motivations that are related to that thing. And it makes that character so much more relatable. And that's exactly what happens with Gore the God Butcher. And I think only Christian Bale, or an actor of Christian Bale's caliber, could pull that off and just boost that character significantly, like Christian Bale did in this movie. And just the look of Gore the God Butcher, too. This is eerie, man. This is haunting. He looks like Voldemort's rejected twin brother meets the Grim Reaper. Jesus, every scene he's in, like, there are moments where he pops up, like, there's a scene where there's a, a bunch of kids, and they're all talking, and then all of a sudden, you just hear Christian Bale's voice in the background, and he just slowly moves out of the shadows. I was like, oh, seriously, like, th that's how good Bale is, and that's how good the visualization of Gore the God Butcher is, and that's how well written Gore the God Butcher is in this movie. While this movie is a lot of fun, I do think that there is a running joke, and maybe a couple of jokes that don't land here and there, but... When a running joke in, in particular that went on for way too long to the point of annoyance. It wasn't anything like Ragnarok where you just kept laughing every scene and you were trying to hear what they were saying next, but it was just another joke and you were laughing even harder that you couldn't even hear what they were saying after that joke as well. It wasn't anything like that. Like There were some gut-busting funny moments in this movie, but there's something introduced with two goats and at first it was funny, the second time it was funny, the third time it was like, okay, like chuckles, fourth time it was like, alright, yeah, hearty, somewhat, half smile, this is getting old, by the, by the seventh time they did it, I was completely annoyed, I was like, nope, too much, you went too far there. I also don't think it's haste as well as Ragnarok. Ragnarok definitely feels longer to me, but for all of Ragnarok, there, it seems like there's more going on in Ragnarok. It seems like this movie takes a little bit to get its footing down, and it seems like once you hit like the 45 minutes uh, halfway point of the movie, that's where things start to kick into gear, even though things are set in stone beforehand. It just felt like that's when the pacing started to ramp up a little bit for me. For me. But I still had a blast with Thor Love and Thunder, one of my favorite movies of Phase 4 of the MCU. One of my favorites of the year, honestly. I mean, when I have this much fun watching a movie, when I'm laughing this much, when I'm this entertained, I'm gonna love a movie like this, even if it has its flaws. It, and it has its flaws, but I'll say this. It's not as good as Ragnarok, but it's better than the first Thor, and it is loads better than Thor The Dark World. And I will say you will really enjoy Thor Love and Thunder with a full bucket of popcorn. So guys, Thor Love and Thunder comes out this weekend. Are you guys going to go see it? And when you do, I want to know what you think of it. Drop me a comment in the comment section below. I'll leave my link to my website in the description below as well. You guys are the best. Thank you for watching. My name is Alex Madden, and I'll see you at the movies somewhere.